Hello, everyone. Um, I will be presenting runtime analysis of the mu plus one EA on the dynamic mean valve function. I am Simone Riedi, and I am one of the authors together with Johannes Lengler. This is mostly a theoretical paper. So here is the map of what I will be covering in this talk. I'll start by giving a quick overview of the mu plus one EA and then talk about selection in a dynamic environment, which is slightly different from the standard selection. And then go over some of the important functions that are dynamic, such as dynamic linear function and the dynamic bean, bean valve function, which is the function we are interested in the paper. And then talk about re the relation between these two functions. Then I move on to some of the related work, such as the, the work on monotone functions, more specifically on the hot topic class, and uh, on the more recent work on dynamic bean valve function. Finally, I'll go over our results, which is on how the population size impacts the mu plus one EA on the bean valve function, and how the hardest optimization region is not close to the optimum for the two plus one EA. Okay, let's get started. So for an overview of the mu plus one EA, I'm assuming you are already familiar with the algorithm, but mu indicates the population size and one indicates the how many offspring are generated in the mutation step. So as an initial JSON, we start by creating new random individuals, new random bit strings, and we call this, popu this the, po the initial population P0. Then we enter a loop where we have a generation step and a selection step. In the generation step, we are given a population and we need to create a new individual. This is, bundle, this is done by mutation. And in the selection step, we are given uh, mu plus one individuals and we have to select uh, the best mu individuals. Therefore, we need to discard the less fit individual. At the end of this loop, we return the final population, which I denoted as P capital K. And so in the generation step, we, it's pretty simple. We, start, we are given a population of mu individuals and we start by selecting X prime, an individual in the population uniformly at random. And from this, uh, and from this individual, we generate another individual X by flipping each bit in X prime with probability C over N independently. C is a given constant given as input to the algorithm while N is the size of the bit strings uh, in the population. So this creates the new individual which is given, uh, which is given to the selection operation. Okay, the selection operator is a little bit more interesting in a dynamic environment so on the right, we see what it does. It's given mu plus one individuals and it needs to create a population of, si of size mu. So I'm making an example here where mu equals 10 and I'm labeling the 10 individuals in the population from X0 to X9 and the newly generated individual X. So what the selection operator does in a dynamic environment is it starts by evaluating all search points using the function, the fitness function. Now I want to emphasize that it evaluates all search points, even though most of, most of them were already evaluated according to this fit, fitness function in previous rounds. And this is where the dynamic keyword comes from because the function is dynamic in the sense that it changes in each iteration of the algorithm. Therefore, we have to evaluate all the search points again because the, their fitness value may have changed. Now this gives some function evaluations, in this case, 11. And then we sort these function values in descending order and we select the best mu individuals. This means for the mu plus one EA, we just discard the less fit individual. So this gives the next population. Okay, as promised, I'm going over some of the dynamic functions. The first one I'll be covering is the dynamic linear function. The dynamic linear function in the kth generation starts by drawing n weights at random from some distribution D and which is given as input, and then uh, computes the, the fitness value of a given individual X as a weighted sum of the entries of X given the, the, the drawn weights. So in a pictorial fashion, for each generation K, I want to emphasize that we have to draw again new weights from this distribution. And we use this new newly drawn weights to compute the fitness value of a search point X using this weighted sum. So now we finally reach the function that we studied in the paper. This is the dynamic mean function. 
the dynamic beam ball function is quite similar to the dynamic linear function. So instead of drawing n weights, we draw a random permutation of the bits. And then we compute the fitness function uh, of a given bit string x by first applying this permutation and then computing the binary value. So in a graphical representation, we have in each generation, we have to draw a new permutation. And then we compute the fitness value of an individual by applying this permutation and computing the binary value. So there is a strong relation between these two functions. And we, I want to talk about it because uh, the, the first function is quite popular, while um, more popular, while the dynamic bean valve function is more recent. And the reason why the dynamic bean valve function is being studied is because it represents a limiting case of the dynamic linear functions. So it, it, we know that the, one of the hardest in, instances of the dynamic linear function becomes the dynamic bean valve. So studying the dynamic bean valve gives also good insights on the dynamic linear function. Okay, now on to the related work. I'll start with related work on monotone functions. Um, on the right hand side, on, on the top, I, we see the definition of a monotone function. Monotone functions are quite easy and it is, it can be thought that they are, they should be easy to optimize. However, they are not, <laughs> not for all algorithms. So uh, in, in a monotone functions, one bits are always preferred over zero bits. So the optimum is the one bit in the is the all one bit string. Um, then we have still on the right some uh, summary of the most important parameters for the algorithm: c the mutation constant, mu the population size, and n the search point size. So on mon on monotone functions, we know that there is there exists a particularly hard instance to optimize, and this is called the this was called the hot topic function class. And for this, for the hot topic class, we have a strong dichotomy between quasi-linear and exponential runtime, depending on the mutation parameter C in a neighborhood around the optimum. So if we look at this, if we look at this image, we see that um, we can fix a C0 for each algorithm. And I drew this as, a, as this line, for which if we pick smaller mutation constants, then we end up with a fast algorithm. But if we pick larger mutation constants, we end up with a slow algorithm, uh, still in a neighborhood around the optimum. And by fast, I, I mean it, it runs in exponential runtime, and by slow, it runs in quasi-linear runtime. So the reason I'm talking about hot topic function is, although this behavior depends heavily on the construction of hot topic, there are quite some striking similarities between the two functions. So the hot topic function is changes throughout the algorithm, but it does not change at the same pace as the dynamic beam valve function. Uh, the hot topic function changes depending on where the, the algorithm, the population of the algorithm is in the search space. Therefore, it changes in a slower pace compared to the dy dynamic beam valve function that changes in each iteration. However, they still share this, this dynamic factor. So some of, the, some of the results that we have are very similar to the hot topic. Uh, as those for the hot topic. So another very interesting result on the hot topic function is for the mu plus one EA. In fact, it was shown that the hardest region to optimize is not close to the optimum. So this is very, very surprising because in optimization, it's usually thought that as closer we get to the optimum, as hard, the harder it becomes to optimize it and make good progress for the algorithm. This is not the case for the mu plus one EA on the hot topic function. And still in a further away from the optimum, we even observe a dichotomy between quasi-linear and exponential runtime, this time depending on the population size mu. So if we fix the mutation constant C, we can find there exists this mu zero such that, uh, again, if we pick a larger population, we end up with a slow and a negative drift for further away from the optimum. Um, while if we pick a smaller mutation, uh, a smaller population size, we end up with a fast algorithm. So this is also very surprising because the population size is thought to be uh, positive. I mean, larger population are thought to Im improve the algorithm, but it's not the case for the hot topic class further away from the optimum. Now, I finally start covering the dynamic bean valve function. And there, there are two experimental results already on the dynamic bean valve function. One it covers the fact that increasing the population size mu from one to five, 
5 helps for both the mu plus 1 EA and the GA. Um, so this seems already in contrast to what we've seen with the hot topic function here, uh, here where we've seen that uh, inc increasing the population size does not help. In, in fact, it hurts the algorithm. But for dynamic mu one function, we see the opposite. That it helps the algorithm. And this is probably because the function changes so, so often. The second in interesting result is that the hardest region to optimize is not at the optimum, but further away from it for the mu plus one EA. So this is in line with previous results on hot topic. OK, now starting with these two experimental results, um, I will add the experimental result on the bottom right. And because, because we, our results are basically a proof of the experimental results. So the first one is, is a proof that the population size always helps for the mu plus one evolutionary algorithm close to the optimum. So the, exper the previous experimental result only suggested that from one, increasing the size from one to five helps here we have a formal proof. And um, maybe I should probably point what, what I mean with helps. I mean that the range of feasible mutation parameter, mutation constants C increases. So we can pick larger C if the population size is large enough and still have a fast algorithm. So here's the theorem that we have. So um, if we assume that the mu plus one EA runs on the dynamic bean valve function, with constant parameter C and some uh, population size that depends exponentially on the mutation constant. And the algorithm is started sufficiently close to the optimum, then with high probability, it will find the optimum in quasi linear time steps. Okay, now I will explore, explore a little bit this theorem. So on the right, we have the theorem and on the bottom right, we have one of the main tools to prove these kind of theorems. This is drift analysis, and it basically studies the expected difference between two, two potential functions at different time steps, consecutive time, step, time steps. So we, in particular, we are studying the drift analysis between degenerate populations. So a population P of the, of the mu plus one evolutionary algorithm is called degenerate if all individuals or search points are identical. So here I have an example of what I mean with a degenerate population. So if we have n equals three and mu equals four, this means that the search points are of size three, bit, string, bit strings of size three, and we have four individuals in the population. In this case, I'm assuming that all individuals are identical to the bit string 101. We can assume, and I will be more precise in the next slide, that after some time steps, say L, we reach another degenerate population. Uh, say one with, where the individuals are equal to the bit string 110. So what we are studying is the drift between degenerate populations, in particular the amount of zeros between a degenerate, an individual in the degenerate population uh, pk compared to the next, which in this case would be pk plus l. So I already suggested that we can study the degenerate population and the reason why we can do this is because of the ingredient one, which is which says that the number of steps between degenerate populations decays exponentially in probability. This means that the number of time steps between two degenerate populations is usually very small, and uh, studying the drift between between them can be done. The second ingredient are Markov chains. So we usually um, so in the in the proof we usually start with assuming we are in a degenerate population. This would be the green state. And then we see what the next general population could become. And we do this by studying these Markov chains. Um, I will not go too much into detail with this because they can become quite hard and quite cumbersome to explain. So the second result is about the hardest optimization region. And on the, on the bottom right, we see the previous result for this topic. And it says that for the mu plus one EA, the hardest region for optimization is further away from the optimum. So we could prove this, however, however, only for mu equals two. And we found, the, we found of course, that the two plus one EA struggles more further away from the optimum. Um, we do have a formal proof of this. Uh, however, I just have the, I'll just put the drift here because it's much easier to explain. Um, so this uh, diagram uh, indicate, there are two, there are two functions here. 
So the blue plane is the just a simple zero plane, while the orange plane is the drift of the two plus one EA. So from drift analysis, we know that if the drift is above the blue plane or above zero, we end up with a fast algorithm that runs in quasi-linear time. While if it is below the blue plane, then we end up with a slow algorithm that ends up in exponential runtime. So the two axes of this graph are the mutation constant C and the proximity to the optimum. So from this, we can read off, for example, that with a mutation constant two, we always end up with a positive drift, no matter how close we are to the optimum. And for example, with a mutation constant four, we always end up with a negative drift compare, no matter where we are compared to the optimum. However, if we, if we look at the intersection between these two graphs, and I hope I, you, can, you can see this, uh, this white line, this white line um, is slightly tilted in a way that we have a larger range of feasible, um, of feasible mutation constant if we are closer to the, to the optimum compared than if we are further away from it. So this in practice means that for some mutation constant, maybe from reading off the graph, I could say 2.3, uh, the algorithm is fast, close to the optimum. However, it, it is slow uh, in a region, in an intermediate region around the optimum. So it will take exponential runtime if started in an intermediate region around the optimum. However, if started close enough to the optimum, it will take just quasi-linear runtime. And um, that's all for my presentation, for my talk. Um, I hope you have some questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Simona, for the very interesting talk. Um, yeah, so uh, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, let's see, Atif. Yes, please. Uh, well done, uh, Simona, very well explained. You explained very well uh, the mm -hmm. algorithm and the background and especially these illustration, they really help. And mm -hmm. I was reading your uh, abstract and uh, it was, it says like you're using a different fitness function at each generation. So I think I did not get to this point from your presentation. Maybe I just missed or confused. Could you please? Uh, yeah, sorry, what slide do you intend? I can like um, you have multiple fitness functions and uh, you are using uh, different fun fitness functions at dis different generations. Yeah, okay. So and what are those uh, functions? Okay, maybe it was, so, so I started off talking about the dynamic linear function. This would be the starting point because it's more popular or has been studied a little bit more. And from this, uh, from this dynamic function, we, we reach the dynamic Beanwell function, which is the okay. function we have all the results on the paper on. And the reason I talked about the dynamic linear function in the first place is because there is a strong connection between these two functions. And the dynamic Beanwell function, which is the function we studied, is a harder instance of the dynamic linear function. So we studying this function gives good insights on the on the other function. All right, that's that's good. Cool. Thanks. Makes sense. Did you like uh, try like if, if instead of using multiple fitness function and your approach and you do compare with uh, an approach which only use one fitness functions? No, we did not. All right. Okay, okay. that's yeah. really interesting. I must yeah. read your paper. Good. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? So I I am a, um, I have a couple of questions. So first of all, I'm curious. Have you thought about um, how maybe changing how frequently this up uh, how frequently this um, change happens might affect uh, the result? Yes. Uh, so we thought about it, but it we did not do it at the end. So this was initially a bachelor thesis, my bachelor thesis. So I started working on just the on this dynamic kind of function, the Beanval where we change in each iteration, but then we, I did not have time to explore uh, your suggestion where we maybe we do an interpolation between the hot topic function and dynamic Beanval yeah. function. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps I can add that, that it's definitely one of the next steps to go. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I think it's, it's, it's very interesting, especially what Simone briefly mentioned, there is this weird connection that it behaves very similar to hot topic function even though they are not dynamic, but at least the intuition is kind of that the hot topic 
functions are also dynamic because they behave different in different parts of the search space. And I think the main difference is that here with these dynamic binval functions, they really change every round. And for hot topic functions, they, I mean, change only every, uh, I mean, they, they, they change very infrequently and, and, and not so often. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, I was also oh, curious how, so this is a really interesting result on the two plus one. Uh, I'm wondering how, how difficult do you think this would be to, to generalize um, to, to, to mu greater than two? Yeah, so the starting point for the proof of the two plus one EA was one of these diagrams here, one of these uh, degenerate population diagrams, Markov chains. And if we are considering a, a region which is further away from the optimum, these diagrams become absolutely immense to study. So I'm talking about like something that fills the entire screen just with these states. And so just for the two plus one EA, I had a, a diagram which is enormous. So going for larger populations, we would probably have to change, I would definitely have to change the approach on how we prove this kind of, these kind of things. So yeah, it, I'm not sure about how we can do that. Or oh, you need, need to have a more clever idea than we had. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we did thought about it. We, we, we even thought that we had a proof at some point, but then it turned out that, uh, yeah, we didn't have a proof. And I, with these di diagrams, it's probably not, not feasible. So, but, but yeah, be more thank clever. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, any further questions? Okay, great. So maybe, Thank maybe I, can, I would have one question. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, yes, so please. You can I ask, so you mentioned that um, Binval is the more most complex function in this dynamic setting. Is do you have a proof for this statement, or is this based so, on your experiments? No, there is a there is a proof. Um, I'm not sure if it is in, in our paper. However, there is a previous paper that talks about it, and. It says that if we took if we draw these weights from the dynamic linear function from a sufficiently skewed distribution, then the then we essentially get the dynamic beam valve function because we we get some like we got a weight say the largest weight uh, becomes larger than the sum of all other weights and this is essentially mm -hmm. the, the the dynamic beam valve function where we swap the bits. And yeah, so there was a yeah. previous paper around for it. And, and that, that paper was on the one plus one EA. So, so yeah. if you want to phrase it like this, then the, uh, it's formally proven that for the one plus one EA, um, dynamic bin wall is the hardest uh, dynamic linear function in, in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. uh, that's for the one plus one EA and for other algorithms, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And do you see any chance to to extend the statement to the static setting to show that binval is the hardest function for the one plus one EA? <laughs> um, I mean, I've thought a bit about this. Other people's, uh, people have also thought about this. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I mean, perhaps it's it's something that, that we should get back to. I think uh, yeah. there are some people who would find this interesting. At least I, I know a few people in this room who would be interested, yeah. Cool. Okay, thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simona. Are there any more questions? Okay. All right, then thank you both to Simona and to Mohammed. Um, I think that's all the talks that we have uh, for this session. Um, so thank you everyone for attending and I hope to see you throughout the conference.